With the world responding to George Floyd's murder and the Black Lives Matter protests sweeping America and the world, there have been a whole load of proposed solutions. Ideas that people believe will solve both issues surrounding racial inequality and police brutality. Among the most radical sounding ideas is the proposal to defund the police. Despite sounding pretty radical, calls for defunding the police have amplified in the last week, with more and more people considering the idea for the first time. But it's not an easy issue to unpack, and the idea brings with it a whole load of questions. From what does defunding look like, wouldn't it just lead to a huge surge in crime, and is it even possible? In this video, we'll attempt to explain why some people want to defund the police, as well as trying to answer all of those questions. Before we do though, let me encourage you to subscribe to TLDI US, and if you think you already have, please just quickly double check for me, as a lot of our viewers haven't actually made the leap and subscribed the US channel just yet. Subscribing and hitting the bell icon means that you'll see all of our latest posts, as we explain the current protests, Trump's feuds with social media giants, and what all of this means for the 2020 election. Thanks so much for your support. While defunding the police sounds like a drastic and reactionary demand, this is actually something which has been considered for years now. Different people have different things in mind when it comes to police defunding, with some calling for relatively small cuts in police spending, and others who want complete abolition of the police force. The general idea is that money that's currently being spent on policing can be redirected to other areas of government, facilitating spending increases in areas such as housing, employment, health, and importantly, education. The logic is that spending money in these areas rather than policing could tackle the root issue. If there was a greater investment in education, many believe that crime rates would decrease. Or if there was less homelessness and unemployment, people might not be driven to crime. The basic idea is that money is being put in the wrong place, tackling the symptom rather than the root issue itself. And it's worth noting that the money here isn't insignificant. If you look at the US's total spending on policing over the last four decades, you'll see a very significant increase. In fact, the US currently spends $115 billion on police funding annually, a number that's tripled since 1980, when funding was only $40 billion, even when adjusted for inflation. Those who advocate for defunding the police argue that this increase isn't justified and will often point to crime figures. Violent crime certainly has dropped since its peak in the mid-90s, where 1.9 million violent crimes were committed every year. But when you compare the numbers from the 1980s to today, you'll notice that despite huge funding increases, crime has pretty much flatlined. This disconnect between police spending and crime rates is evidence to some that money is being spent in the wrong places and could be more effectively distributed. The question of how crime can be kept under control with a smaller police force is a legitimate concern, and it's understandable why many are concerned that defunding could lead to huge crime spikes. Those in favour of such measures would point to figures like the ones we've just discussed to show that the link between funding and crime isn't as linear as you might expect. And they also point to New York City. This is probably an example you've seen parroted over social media a lot recently, but it's one of few examples of what might happen if the level of policing were to fall. In New York between 2014 and 15, officers staged what's been called a policing slowdown to protest decisions made by the city's mayor. The aims of the slowdown ran deeper than ordinary strikes or workplace walkouts. The police department wanted to show the mayor and the wider city how important their role was. They expected that by reducing policing, crime would in turn increase, not significantly enough to cause major harm to the city, but enough to show their worth. The problem is that it kind of backfired. Instead of crime rates increasing during the slowdown, they actually fell. The police did continue to respond to calls, so it's not just a case of crime not being identified. But while major crimes stayed roughly at the same level, non-major crimes and narcotic offences dropped. In fact, criminologists Christopher P. Sullivan and Zachary P. O'Keefe wrote about the phenomenon in a paper in Natural Human Behaviour. Their conclusions was that overly aggressive policing brings with it a level of social disruption that actually leads to more crime. Therefore, during the slowdown when there was a reduced proactive policing, there was actually a calming effect. 
Advocates would also emphasise that they don't want to turn their back on vulnerable communities and let people fend for themselves. Instead, they're proposing that work that was previously done by police officers could be moved to other officials. For example, instead of having the police respond to drug abuse, this could be handled by addiction experts. Or, counsellors could take over responses to mental health issues. The argument is that the police are a blunt tool, and while force and security may be necessary in some situations, such as burglary or murders, that doesn't mean that they're a one-size-fits-all solution. Therefore, other specialists could be allowed to take their place when responding to community issues, not only allowing experts to handle the problems, but also reducing the number of times that police and the potential for violence are brought into situations. And the argument is that there's a lot of space for funding increases in these areas. And it's certainly true that the US spends far less on social issues than other countries, especially when compared to Europe. The US spends 18.7% of the national budget on social programs, compared to Germany's 25.1% or France's 31.2%. It's not just spending where the US is very different to other comparable countries though. The US arrests and incarcerates people at a higher rate than other countries around the world. In the US, 698 in every 100,000 people are currently in jail. Compare this to England and Wales's 144 in every 100,000, or 114 in Canada, or even Denmark's 59. The argument is that the United States spends a huge amount of money on jails and police departments. This disrupts communities and may in turn lead to increases in crimes, causing a vicious cycle to form. This could be why, despite vastly higher spending and incarceration rates, the US's murder rate is still four times higher than Canada, and the number of rapes in the US is four times higher than that of Denmark. Those who advocate for the defunding of the police argue that the freed up spending could be shifted over to other areas, which would do a better job of decreasing crime rates. Not everyone's a fan of this argument though, with fierce opposition arising against this growing movement. While those in favour of defunding argue that the police are a blunt instrument which is being used to handle a variety of social and societal issues, those who support the police argue that defunding is in itself a blunt instrument. They argue that without the current levels of policing in place, there's no guarantee for public safety. And while there are examples of small changes in policing, like the New York City example we mentioned earlier, there aren't many examples of countries fundamentally reworking how the police interact with their community. Even those who are sympathetic to the cause, and acknowledge racial bias and issues of police brutality, argue that this kind of major change could simply be too jarring. In fact, that's an argument that was made by Wisconsin Governor Tony Evers. Evers does acknowledge issues, and says that he wants the police departments to overhaul how they use force. We can make sure that police services are such that people of all colour and circumstances feel comfortable with the services they offer, and aren't automatically sceptical of the police. However, he went on to say that officers are in the profession for the right reason, so the idea of completely disassembling the police in the state or Milwaukee I couldn't support. This is an argument that a number of police advocates make, that just because some police officers are acting in a racist manner or exploiting their status doesn't mean that the whole institution is wrong or racist. They argue that defunding could actually make situations worse, as more stretched and less trained officers may not be able to respond as effectively to issues, potentially throwing up more problems than it solves. Those in favour of defunding might say that we've seen all of this before though, a few years ago, in the aftermath of the killings of Mike Brown, Eric Garner and Tamir Rice, police forces across the country promised to roll out new measures, community policing, implicit bias training, body cameras and increased transparency. However, despite these efforts, the issues didn't go away, with the US still ranking third highest when it comes to police killings in G20 countries. So some are saying that this time, we need to take more drastic action. It seems that one city is willing to take such action, and possibly will be a case study for how this idea works or doesn't in practice. That's because in the last few days, the Minneapolis City Council, the city where Floyd was murdered, announced that they plan to dismantle their police department. 
In a joint statement, the council announced that decades of police reform efforts have proved that the Minneapolis Police Department cannot be reformed and will never be accountable for its action. We are here today to begin the process of ending the Minneapolis Police Department and creating a new transformative model for cultivating safety in our city. Ultimately, 9 out of 13 councillors supported the move, with the city's mayor and police chief discouraging the action. Regardless, as one of the council members tweeted, the decision is veto-proof, so it looks like Minneapolis might be leading the way, and depending on its success, could either serve as a warning or a gold standard for other cities to follow. What do you think though? Do you think that the police should be supported and given the tools they need to improve themselves? Do you think that the police force should be shrunk and responsibility and funding redistributed? Or do you think that the police should be abolished altogether? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. And as always, you can also get involved in the conversation over on Discord. Be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon for more updates as this situation plays out. Special thanks to our Patreon backers who make videos like this one possible.